So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for slightly less people, but I think these sessions are going to be at least as interesting as before. Uh, we're talking about education and training, uh, XR's role in them, and we have a really cool four speakers. And first one is uh, Luis Pepe. I hope I pronounced it more or less correctly. You can correct me. No? Just Luis. Uh, from Flanders, Belgium, and uh, she'll tell you more about it. She's basically the coordinator of uh, the biggest educational initiative using a whole bunch of headsets, namely around 1,000 and 700 schools. And uh, they've been running the project for over a year. Uh, actually, our company, Futoglass, has also been part of it. Uh, it's been really great to see like a top-down initiative of how VR should be implemented in secondary schools and vocational schools, I guess, moreover, um, happen. So yeah, let's, uh, let's hear it for Luis. Thank you. So. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, it feels appropriate to have a, a, help, a handheld mic uh, in a karaoke bar, so uh, very excited about that. So yeah, welcome, uh, and I'm happy that you're here. Um, so like Mart said, uh, Flanders actually uh, deployed one of the largest educational deployments of uh, virtual reality. And I'm here today to take you uh, for a tour, a little tour behind the scenes, how we did it, what we did it, some problems that we uh, encountered along the way. Um, so yeah. Well, first off, uh, I can imagine it's, it's the same uh, in Belgium as in the countries where you're from. Teachers are encountered with some problems. They are facing some problems. First of all, yeah, price of materials, it, the materials for technical and vocational schools these days, it's just grown so much. It goes from uh, prices of, of uh, metal, uh, wood, bricks, everything that they need to practice with their students. It's just so expensive. Um, and we found that virtual reality could be a solution for that. They could train virtually before they do it in the real world, um, so they don't waste materials. They, students always make mistakes, so you have to throw materials out. Um, virtual reality provides a, a great alternative for that. But also, something that really accelerated our program um, was COVID. Students had to learn from home. It was very difficult for teachers to adapt to that. Um, and also, virtual reality could be a solution for that. Something I think that is probably the, the most relatable for a lot of teachers. They want to do things with their students that just aren't possible in the real world. They want to visit a, a chemical factory. Um, they want to see things from the inside that you, you just can't see. Um, so again, virtual reality really uh, provided a solution there. But also for techniques and procedures that you can't to do in a classroom. Um, think about welding, you need materials, you need equipment. Right. Um, so yeah, we ultimately found out through a lot of research um, that has been done in, in uh, a lot of other countries as well, that XR could be um, a great complementary way um, for teachers to um, yeah, provide a, some sort of a solution for all the problems that they face. So the solution that we came up with um, is, has a very exciting name, XR Action Plan, um, and basically we were looking for a way, since we knew that VR could be a solution for all the problems that we have, we were looking for a way to implement it um, in a structured way, in a sustainable way. Um, and there were four challenges um, that were important for us to um, come up with a solution. First of all, we needed hardware. But you can have hardware, but then again, you need software. You need training for teachers, um, and then you also need research to see how efficient is it um, and how can we make it sustainable in the future. So we came up with four uh, main pillars, the first one being the XR landing service. Basically, it's a, a landing service of um, XR hardware. We have uh, kits like you, uh, you see here on the pictures. Um, we have uh, around 250, I think, uh, of those kits that have been uh, distributed to approximately 700 schools in Flanders. So the kits consist of, like you can see, it's, I think it's the, the first time that I, I heard the word PICO here 
so uh, <laughs> we have uh, Pico headsets, um, four in each kit, um, and then we also have uh, an iPad for augmented reality. And um, there's also a router, a charging system. Um, so it's a full package, basically. We distributed those to the schools. Um, so we have in Flanders, I believe it's, it's most likely in, in your countries as well. We have school communities. Um, so each school is part of a community and we distribute the hardware to all the communities and they organize um, internally among the schools of the community. Like I said, you can have nice hardware, but it's really the software that you need to convince teachers of the benefit and the added value of uh, using XR in their lessons. So we invested a lot of time, a lot of testing um, to come up with a content library. Um, currently, it consists of about 400 uh, different learning mod modules in multiple fields. So it goes from uh, electricity, um, we also have construction, uh, automobile industry, um, but also healthcare, food industry, chemistry, general courses um, such as history, geography, basically every, everything a teacher would need um, to complement the learning of their students. Um, they will find something that is relevant for their subject or their course. The whole um, software library is managed by the RTCs, um, so we manage everything remotely through Arbor XR. Nice content is very important, and we've learned that along the way. Um, you need something context-bound um, for teachers to get them excited. You can't show uh, an application for hairdressing to a, a welding teacher, for example. So you need something that is context-bound. A good example of that is FutuClass, which is really relevant um, for our science teachers. Um, they have a lot of things that are almost one-to-one -one match with the curriculum um, that they have to teach. So it's very important that you have something to really um, match the, the learning goals of the subject. Otherwise, a teacher will think, yeah, it's nice, but can't use it in my classroom, so what should I do with it? Um, but also, there's a lot of different qualities of uh, games and apps that were developed. So that's always uh, something to keep in mind as well. Um, something that for most of our teachers is a big issue as well is language. A lot of the available content worldwide is in English. Um, so we were very happy with Future Class that they uh, proposed um, to localize the app for us. So they uh, translated everything to Dutch, which is super beneficial for our teachers and mostly for the students so that they are able to learn in their own language. But then you also need, um, and fortunately a lot of the apps that we have, have something um, like a, a portal where um, teachers can find lesson plans, um, they can find exercises to do, um, so it really helps them how to work with the app um, and, and learn um, how to use it with their students. But then again, you also need support. A lot of times things can go wrong and it's, it's nice to, to see that a lot of developers like to think with us um, and provide great support. We had the hardware, we had the software, but you can't just drop a box of headsets in a school without any context. So we also um, invested in XR Academy, um, which is basically, um, it consists of five universities in Flanders who are organizing trainings this year, it's almost a custom-made training, so teachers can apply. They can say whatever subject they want or whatever content they want, and XR Academy will provide a training for it. Everything is for free, by the way, since it's government-funded, so schools are able to participate in it for free. And that way, we can really make sure that everyone has an equal chance to, uh, to participate in this. The training is for a part technical, how to operate the headsets, how does everything work. But um, there's also more um, um, pedagogical training. So how should you use it in a classroom? What are the ways that you can work? Do you um, do individual? Do you work uh, in pairs? Things like that. Um, that really helps uh, teachers to get started with it as well. 
And this year, we also invested in some platforms to create custom content. So it could be a no-code platform, but also uh, 360 uh, based. Um, so we're also providing trainings for teachers to come up with their own experiences and their own uh, custom-made lessons in uh, VR. Lastly, we also have um, XR research that is being conducted by some universities, um, some colleges uh, that you see here on the screen. Um, and we will use that research um, after uh, two years. The, the project will end, but I assume that we will get additional funding to keep it going. Um, but the research really will help us to figure out how we can improve what we should change potentially, um, to see how that we can keep it going in the future. We've been doing this for about a year and a half now, but of course the, the preparation time that it took before we originally launched um, is much larger, so I think we've been um, working on this project for about three years now, um, and there's some things that we fortunately learned along the way. Um, basically, the main um, thing that we learned so far is that a top-down centralized approach works. Before we noticed that schools were purchasing headsets, um, some, sometimes even a large amount of headsets, um, and then they were like, cool, but what, what should we do with it? Um, and in most of the cases, those headsets just ended up in some closet collecting dust um, and never came out of it again. So with this project, we see that schools have the ability to try it, they can learn, they can experiment with it, um, they can see what works for them. Uh, we have a lot of apps available, they can try it out as many times as they want, everything is for free, so it's very low risk. Um, there's nothing but time that you need, so that way it's a, it's a great initiative for teachers to get started with it, to learn what works for them um, and potentially later invest in some hardware and software themselves. Um, so we noticed that that's happening already. Um, so that's a, a great, a great thing to see. But also when teachers were purchasing hardware before, they usually didn't know how to install content, how to manage all the headsets, uh, updates, things like that. Um, so to have an MDM that is centrally uh, managed by the RTCs in this case, um, you take a lot of burdens away from the schools. So they are able just to pick up the headsets and it's basically plug and play. So they don't have to do anything, everything is done remotely for them. Um, so that's again very low risk, it takes nothing but time to get started um, and that's really added value for teachers. They can just pick it up, start, experiment, learn, play, whatever they want. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, something that I'll talk about more in the, the next slide as well. But also content is king. That's something that we said from the beginning and it, it proved to be true. We had a very small library of content in the beginning, but it kept systematically growing. Um, to the, the 400 modules that we currently have, which are still expanding uh, more uh, the coming weeks and uh, months. But we see that in the beginning, a lot of teachers were skeptical because they didn't know what content was available, they didn't know what would fit their subject, their course, um, and along the way we've really let them try out an app or multiple apps that are directly applicable for their course and their subject. And usually they get the aha moment and they're like, okay, this is something that I can really use in, in my lessons. Um, where they, before, sometimes they, they tried on a headset in a, in a theme park on a roller coaster. Uh, and they were like, yeah, it's fun for gaming, but it's nothing educational. There's, there's no educational value to it. And by providing apps and content that is relevant for them. We really got them excited in, in using uh, virtual reality and that's just what we intended with this project. So it's, it's great to see that that's working. But also training is uh, the fourth thing that, that really proved to be essential um, to get the teachers going. Because we had some schools 
where they, they had a teacher come to a training and then the teacher just kept it to, his, to himself, didn't share it. So the other teachers were like, yeah, we, we see the headset, but what should we do with it? And along the way, more and more teachers follow the training and we see that it, it spreads around the school teachers learn from each other as well students pick it up really fast so sometimes even students train the teachers in in some schools um, so it's it's good to see that those experiences are shared um, and people learn from each other um, so that way we're able i think in in most schools we have a, a full team now that is really up to speed with how everything works how they should use it in a classroom um, and that way we really get the headsets being used um, where before they just ended up in a closet. So some of the, the results that we have so far after about a year um, is that we see that schools are convinced of the benefits and of the added value. So we have uh, a lot of schools that decided to invest um, in XR themselves. So we, we have schools that purchased headsets and they use the content library that we have available to decide which content they wanted to purchase for themselves. So they, they had a chance with our uh, headsets to try out as many apps as possible and decide which one worked for them. And then they, they invested in it themselves. But also other countries are doing similar things. We noticed um, in Germany, for example, that they are now, now doing a, a similar project. Um, and we've talked with a, a lot of other countries who are exploring the options of, of doing something similar to themselves. So I think that's a, a great way uh, to prove that a, a top-down top uh, centralized approach really works. So um, yeah, this is my last slide and it provides a, a bit of an overview of um, the companies and developers and partners in this project. Um, so it gives you a bit of an overview from the content that we have available now. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Yeah, so the government um, observed, just like we did, that schools were on their own island investing in, in some hardware, ended up in a closet. So they wanted, because they know the value of XR, and they wanted to make it, do a systematic approach to give everyone an equal chance to try it out and to try it out in a way that works. So in a way that they are supported, um, that they get the training they need, it's low risk. Um, so that way we hope to get the technology systematically used in Flemish schools. So that's, that's a bit of the, the goal uh, with this project. Any other questions? Um, for now, I think it's mostly construction, since we have a lot of content available for construction. A lot of it was um, also developed by the government itself, because um, that's another project that we have uh, currently going on. It's called InnoVet, where um, schools can apply for a fund to together in co-creation with software developers to build their own content. I think that resulted in about 20, 25 apps, and most of them um, are in construction or electricity. Um, and because those were developed in co-creation with teachers, by Flemish teachers, um, that's really a one-on-one -on -one match with the, the curriculum. So we see that those are very popular, um, but also logistics is, is quite popular. Um, yeah, I think those are the, the two main areas. Uh, but we hope this year, also with additional trainings and additional events, to get all the other domains uh, excited about it as well. Definitely. Um, so one of the um, conditions of applying for an Innovet uh, fund is that you have to make it uh, available for free for uh, schools. So, yeah. Um, and then 
you can commercialize it for companies. So we have uh, a lot of the apps that are available in companies as well, in the industry as well, uh, but then it's license-based and then things like that. Yeah, I think since it's it's government funded, schools are able to try it out for free. And I don't think they would do it if they had to commit to a, a one year license or something like that. Um, that might be difficult, but also now we reach out to a developer or that's what we, we used to do. Now we have developers reach out to us. But in the beginning, we reached out to a developer um, and we were able in to to have this, this contact with the developer and to provide 700 schools um, to use their content. If a developer would have to reach out to all the 700 schools individually, I think that's uh, that's quite a, quite a task. But the other way around as well for a school, if they they want to create a, a library of content. They would have to reach out to all the different companies, uh, experiment, test all the apps. Um, they would have to, to buy licenses. They would have to have someone almost full-time testing to create such a library as we have. And I don't think that's something that schools would do since it takes so much time and money. Um, so by this initiative, they're able to, to try it out for free, low risk, t doesn't take a lot of time. Um, so th I think that's, that's quite beneficial for them. Um, and by doing this, they're able to make smart choices when they, they invest in it themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what we thought as well. So we, we wanted to, to make a, a systematic approach um, and to get uh, as many schools as possible excited about uh, XR. So, yeah, so uh, the, the research is, uh, is currently being conducted, um, but I think uh, in a few months they will, they will share the first report. Uh, so you'll be able to, to see all the results there. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Louise.